uh, first of all, I'm very sorry uh, to hear that you're going through such a difficult time. And I hope that you are getting professional help. Uh, you're nodding yes, uh, that's good. Uh, so, uh, you know, Zen practice um, can help any situation, in, including desperate situations, but it's very important that uh, you do seek professional help whenever you're having a serious problem, uh, such as uh, you're having. Uh, your question uh, is about uh, life. Is it worth living? So we always say, why do you live your life? That's a uh, similar question, but uh, it casts a different uh, light uh, on the great work of life and death. Yeah, it's for whom? So our response to that, of course, and our teaching is uh, for all beings. So all beings share our life. We participate in our life with all beings. So coming uh, to realize that uh, can really help to uh, create a, a foundation you know, for uh, our behavior, a, a firm foundation. Sometimes when things get really difficult, uh, we feel that we're just floating in space. I think all of us have had that experience to a certain extent. And perhaps you're having that to um, a very extreme extent uh, right now. So our practice you know, is oriented through the four great vows. So immediately in the first great vow, we direct our attention to all beings. That uh, suffering, the kind of suffering you're having, other similar forms of suffering, uh, is universal. So to be sentient, we say sentient, uh, beings. That's um, not a bad translation of uh, Sang, uh, Jung Sang, and many beings, um, beings in uh, the sense of um, having some kind of uh, strong feelings, sentience. They're numberless. Right there, you know, I am not the only one. Sentient beings are numberless. And to be sentient means uh, to suffer in some form or another. It also means uh, to be alert, to be aware, in this case, to be aware of the suffering of all beings. So uh, our vow is to we talked about this word a little in a recent session, is to ferry them across. We translate it as save because it's a more concise. So that do at the end, Jung Sang Wu Bian So Wan, do. Ferry them across the sea of suffering. Now that's uh, the image. So uh, a sea of suffering, uh, suggests something that's immense. How can we ever get across you know, this ocean uh, of suffering? So that puts our life in a somewhat different uh, perspective. The second vow is, we say delusions, and that's real shorthand for Clashes, the many different kinds of uh, emotional and cognitive disturbances that we have. And certainly the, uh, <clears throat> the notion, the impetus of taking your own life is an extreme form. But it's included 
in what we call kleshas. It's hard to translate uh, that, that word, but it's uh, all of the different forms of uh, especially psychological suffering. So the kleshas are, are endless. You almost have to expect some form of suffering to appear. Nevertheless, we vow to cut them off. So cut implies like a sudden complete breaking with. So a new life appears. The other two vows are not as directly relevant uh, to what we're talking about now. Um, the teachings are infinite. We vow to learn them all. So Buddhist practice consists of meditation and study. We have classes and so forth, and Buddhism is a form of teaching. Uh, it's an immense teaching. Just look at all of the lists that we're presented with. These teachings are helpful. Uh, they're not learning for learning's sake. They help our lives. They give our lives direction and meaning. So we vow to learn them, you know, both through study in the ordinary sense of that word and through meditation practice, which is where we really attain the meaning of these uh, teachings. And we sum it all up with the, the Buddha way, uh, we say inconceivable. The original language is nothing is higher, nothing is more sublime. Inconceivable way. I think that's actually a very brilliant translation. What we're about in this practice is beyond conceptual thought. So we're always uh, advised not to constantly indulge in conceptual thought. Certainly it is necessary to lead an ordinary human life, but not to get lost in it. The way that we're following, the way that the Buddha, the historical Buddha exemplifies and that is contained in the very meaning of the word Buddha, which means awake, you know, completely awaken you know, to this world, completely. Sometimes we feel we're in uh, such a deep hole that there's almost no chance of climbing out of it and seeing the light and completely awakening to this world. But that's what we vowed to do. The Buddha way is inconceivable. Uh, we vow to attain it. So, again, I don't mean to uh, reduce uh, your difficult situation to a uh, set of formulas, but I do think that the four great vows say it all. What we're faced with and what we have to direct our efforts toward. I remember where you used to sit in the old Dharma run. I always sat in the same place, that west wall. <laughs> it was always good to see you there. And it's good to see you now. So please realize that uh, by your presence, by your question, you're helping all of us. Thank you again. Are there any other questions? I'd like to say something. Is that okay? Go ahead. My name is Margaret, and I just wanted to share how this practice has saved my life and continues to save my life. I um, 
have struggled with suicidal ideation and uh, attempts uh, since I was a teenager and had gotten professional help and it had disappeared and then it came back uh, really strong around the time I came to the Kansas Zen Center uh, 20 something years ago and I was ashamed and embarrassed to talk about it but I finally did. I was getting professional help. I was exercising. I was doing all the things I'd been taught and it wasn't helping. It wasn't helping. And I finally went to an interview uh, with um, Zen Master uh, He Kuang. Uh, I think it was when he was a Judah Copsonin. But anyway, I, I admitted all of this in an in interview. And that interview, Stan, saved my life. Um, I don't know if you know that. Uh, but Stan gave me some, Zen Master He Kuang gave me a very simple practice uh, that I uh, was to try doing Kwan Sen Bo So every waking minute, every waking minute with a mala. And uh, I grew up Catholic, so that was, you know, I could get that. <laughs> and and uh, I did that. And I did that every waking moment. And whenever the depression and anxiety got really bad, I would remember and I would, I would do it. And I did that for a very long time. And it helped to ground me uh, until a couple of years later, I had an experience that I went to talk to Zen Master He Kuang about which was very similar to your karma's like dry grass, it burns up in an instant. And I'm not going to tell you that it's never come back from that moment. That would not be true. But for me, when it comes back, I know that I need to practice harder because my life depends on it. And the life of my family members who are younger than me who struggle with this depends on me not doing that. And I just want to share that with you. Thank you, Margaret. Well, you might try uh, chanting Kwan Sen and Bosal every minute of your life. It seems to be effective in circumstances such as yours. Yeah, I understand that the four great vows seem like a great mountain. And it may be that it induces hopelessness that you can never do that. But uh, you can certainly um, beseech the Bodhisattva of compassion. Um, I don't know if you already have uh, that kind of connection with you know, Kwan Sen Bozal chanting in your practice. Uh, it's a very strong practice and um, as Margaret was saying, um, it doesn't have to be limited to uh, formal practice time. Uh, that um, so you can do it with a mala, and uh, your malas really really help. Uh, you know, it's something tangible, something you can touch, something you can hold on to. Uh, so it can be uh, you know of great assistance. Use a mala, so you can do that when you're sitting. And uh, you can do it uh, at, uh, at any time when your mind is not required for uh, other activities, you can put it that way, <laughs> um, which is uh, pretty much all the time. It's amazing how little we actually need to use our mind <laughs> in our lives. Uh, usually we seem to be on uh, automatic pilot in some kind of way because we're so accustomed to what uh, has to be done um, uh, my practice uh, when I'm sitting is uh, to repeat a mantra, uh, either uh, Kwan Sen Bo Sa or um, Hua Om Sang Jong. Uh, Hua Om Sang Jong chanting, I first heard about it when Zen Master Sung San had uh, the Sangha, especially at the Providence Zen Center, chanting this. Um, all day long uh, when uh, they had to raise a lot of money. Now that, that's uh, not the same sort of situation you know, that you're faced with. But 
he was asked, you know, why chant Wawam uh, Song Jong? He said, Wawam Song Jong chanting is like Kwan Zan Bosal chanting with a gun. Mm. <laughs> Not sure I relate to that expression completely, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's very strong, um, both in its sound, Wawam Song Jong, and what it uh, signifies, which is all the bodhisattvas from infinite time and space. Uh, so some kind of strong practice uh, like that, um, something you can do, uh, not simply when you're sitting, uh, can be very effective. Um, so we've talked about now, you know, during you know, this after practice question and answer session, if you ever want to talk to either myself uh, or Judy, uh, please contact us and we're more than happy to stay in touch with you.